Good evening. Come in, come in. Um, very delighted to see such a big turnout for our first ever MFA conference, announcing the MFA, to be honest, and which we call Textiles Unlimited because we believe that in the future textiles will have an unlimited possibility to develop. And hopefully through whatever is going to be said tonight, we can share that idea and become even more enthusiastic and welcoming to embed the future of textiles in New York area, but also beyond, obviously. We have a very interesting panel lined up and we are welcoming you. We hope that together we will share a, a very passionate moment of what this, all, is, this is all about. As you know, textile is around us, is on our bodies, is in our houses, is in our lives, is completely uh, interwoven with our existence. Therefore, we think it's so important to revive textile, to prevent it from dying, which is, uh, was almost happening. And we see now a turnaround and we see a comeback of interest in textiles in almost every other domain. Also, we see that textiles will maybe have very new applications in the future, so there's also a growing innovative interest in what is textiles. It is as old as human beings are. It's invented by our um, forefathers in, in a very early stage, and that makes it even more endearing, I think, today. Uh, Willem is going to introduce the first speaker, and then we will go from there. Have fun. Um, hi everyone, thank you for being here. Um, the first speaker I'm going to announce to you is Gabi Espor. Um, I'm very excited that he wants to participate in this panel discussion tonight. Um, I got introduced to him around two years ago by Lee, and uh, he intrigued me from the beginning. Um, he runs together with two of his partners uh, the by now famous company called uh, Tree Espor. Um, Gabi is able to um, use technology from a craft point of view. So he is um, really taking care and putting a lot of time in 3D printing, in laser cutting, um, from a sort of um, aesthetic perspective. So instead of like making um, clothes that, that have technolo technological features, um, Gabi is very much focused on exploring the aesthetic um, boundaries of using technology. Um, he is currently also on view in the Cooper Hewitt um, in the exhibition called uh, Maker Breaker. If you want to see his work uh, from close and for longer, I can definitely recommend you to visit it. It's, it's pretty amazing. And uh, yeah, so here he is, Gabi S4. And our work is mainly about collaboration, so a lot of things that you will see today are collaborations with different um, tech people, the architects, and designers, and so on. So I want to go back a little bit to the beginning of um, when 3S4 started using technology. And this is uh, digital printing in the early days, in 2007. We were trying to print digitally, but it was impossible to do it in New York because they only printed billboards. So it was kind of difficult to get the ink to go through the 
textile. You need to have something soft like uh, like a, <coughs> a silk print. And so we had to go to Rati in Italy to do this. And collaboration was with a, a fractal artist or fractal uh, geek. Um, in, uh, there was a few of them here. And we got their permission. And the file was like a football size large. And the technicians at Rati were freaking out and so on. So it was not an easy work, but fun. Um, so I go back to, this is 2007, spring, summer. And this is New York Fashion Week, uh, 2006, September. Um, you can see the intricacy in something like that is kind of impossible to do with, with another method um, than digital printing. So these are fractal prints and they're done uh, digitally and they're basically mathematical formulas and very intricate to get the detail like this. And this dress is in the, was shown in a show called New York Now at the Victoria and Albert Museum and it's part of the collection right now. This is a smoke print, smoke fractal. Again, some psychedelic fractals from another artist. And this was spring summer 2008, uh, New York Fashion Week. It's another recent one, uh, spring summer 2016, uh, New York Fashion Week. And this is part of the FIT Museum collection right now. It's actually on show at the FIT Museum. And this, these are uh, recent prints, part of a collection we presented last September. These are all based on sound geometry, and they were all designed in Rhino. So they come from 3D files, uh, 3D digital files. Uh, so they're all based on sound vibrations. So they became reminiscent to us of uh, um, animal furs or animal skin. So here we go into laser cutting, just going into progression to kind of lead you up to today. And this was a show at the Jewish Museum. The uh, collection was called Merkaba, and it stayed at the museum for six months. This was uh, spring, summer 2014, New York Fashion Week. So we were playing with the tithing from the three religions. Christianity, Judaism, and, uh, and Islam. So um, combining and uniting different geometries to show that they come from the same place. This is the digital file, a uh, vector file. So. Everything in this collection was cut like that. So you can cut the, the pattern and cut the, the, well, cut the print and cut the pattern. So basically cut it all at once. Uh, again, to get the intricacy and the accuracy, it's very, very easy to use this, uh, to use digital files and, and mathematics like that. This was part of the Folk Art Museum 2014 exhibition. Uh, 
and this is leather laser cut. New York Fashion Week, uh, 2015, September. This is a collection based on uh, crop circles. And again, to get the accuracy of crop circles exact, we had to use uh, laser cutting. This was shown in, uh, this is a, a part of collection fall 2012. cutting uh, of vinyl. This was the step into 3D printing. So we were kind of interlacing laser cutting. Uh, metal laser cutting, very interesting. Here are different materials, including tube. Here's a flat pattern, so you can see how it comes on the body. Again, laser cutting pieces, so using laser cutting for actual cutting and for pattern. And now we go into 3D printing. Um, this was part of Merkaba show, also presented spring, summer, uh, sorry, September 2013, Jewish Museum. This is the geometry behind the dress. It's actually a fractal that it's uh, six sizes down. And it's in, all, it's in all directions. So when you put this together, it's a cube. So this dress is based on platonic solids, basically octahedra, uh, interlaced together. So each, each one of those units you move by itself, individually. So when you have movement on the body, you're going to feel the whole textile moving in all directions. Um, at least six directions, as far as I can explain. And the scaling of this is Fibonacci, so it's a 1.618 scale up. So that's the only way something like this could work. We tried so many different ways, but that was the only way that we could make it individually independent. Each unit is individually moving by itself. This is the flat pattern of the dress. This dress was also part of uh, Manus Ex Machina last year at the Met. This is the actual 3D print on the table in our studio, Christmas. Uh, also very scary to put it together, uh, super delicate. And this is 360 degree photography with 160 cameras. We thought that was a nice way to document the dress. And this dress was part of a collection after that, uh, 2015, September, New York Fashion Week. And this dress uh, represents possibilities of lace, what we imagine as 3D lace. So this is one of the units of how we started digitally. And it's all mathematically very accurate to make it um, independently moving. So you can see this is a hexagon and inside there's a lot of hex geometry and triangular geometry. And this was the test print. Here's a rhino file. Again, Maya file. That's rhino again. Uh, these are the computer programs, if you're familiar.
them in your return. Um, this was the last, actually not last, this was uh, fall 2016, a collection called Biomimicry. We were studying um, different skins from animals such as reptiles, fish, and, and, and plant eaters, and ant eaters, and all kinds of different types of cockroaches, and insects, and, and plants, and cells. So it was kind of a combination of all these different skins. Fascinating stuff to try to emulate it. So this is the pangolin's rest. And it's made out of a hex geometry, again, individually moving each unit. Uh, it kind of moves like a snake. This is the dress printed flat. Uh, you can see how many pieces it has to be printed in, because the binding box for something like this is still not capable to have the dress all in, in one print. So all of this is printed individually and then assembled over a power mesh underdress, like a, a lining, and it actually has a zipper. And this is her monograph dress. That's the flat pattern for it. Um, it's a circle cut in three spirals in a Fibonacci sequence. This was a study of uh, waves going in four directions. Quite, fa quite uh, fascinating and, and challenging to form in 3D. So here we go. I'm going to play a video, if it works, of another dress called Oscillation. is about the geometry of vibration. Everything at the base, base level is just vibration, that nothing is actually solid. So what we perceive as solid is just a mirage. What is the geometry that lies behind all this vibration? We realize that it actually has a shape. It is related to sound and related to light. So we realize that there's all these frequencies that are sacred frequencies that speak to our essence, to our DNA, uh, on the cellular level. So we felt that that was a very interesting subject to bring to fashion and put these vibrations on the human body. For this collection, we generated a lot of different cellular kind of nodal textiles. It's a whole catalog of different interwoven, interlocking structures that are based and derived from vibrational geometries and frequency geometries. What we try to teach is, uh, first of all, it's a great lesson because we learn so much about new technology. And just the fact that you can do things that you never even dreamed about that are uh, possible opens so many doors uh, just to work with these crazy colors, for example and create objects that you can never dream that you can put all these colors in one piece. It's amazing. This dress was produced flat, has a flat pattern. So it's all printed as, as kind of two-dimensional pieces of a puzzle that we then assemble on the body. And to do that, it's essential that the material is, is flexible and can move. There's not many ways to do that with 3D printing, and Stratasys is one of the few companies that can do that for us. And then the kind of coloration ideas of it. The whole design is about making the coloration and the form kind of relate to each other and have a sort of dialogue with each other, so that as something thickens, as it thins, as it gets bigger, smaller, all the kind of variations in form, the coloration is responsive to that, and the, the, the materiality is responsive to that. It's really essential to be able to code the kind of physical material with the digital material with, with something that is responsive to the, the body and form and function of the piece. I think just to giving this platform to create your dreams is a wonderful thing that I am so
navigate this big world of new technology, but with this very poetic and human uh, approach. Now we go to a very different energy, an uh, indomitable energy, I call it in the new magazine. Ms. Collins is here to uh, talk about her work and her upcoming installation in the new museum. She is doing uh, textile installations. She had a career first as a knitwear designer, crazy one. I think they would do it be so amazing now, but she did not do that. She is uh, dedicated to art and it's fiber art, but it's also installation art and with family, video, and friends and colleagues. She's also very much in a co collaborative mood. Uh, her approach is wild and dynamic and colorful and fetishistic, and uh, I say uh, in the article, it starts with don't fence her in, because then there's a problem. So she creates fences, but they are fictional fetishistic fences, I think. Please. a wonderful introduction and also I want to thank you for the exquisite article in your brand new publication. I have to say in all my time of being in my creative career and having people write about me, I've never read such a beautiful thing. So it's very moving for me. Um, as an artist to have, and designer, to have great words written about me is something that's very important and very poignant. Because my words aren't always as good. So thank you also for inviting me here. This is exciting to be part of Textile Month. I have to go back. I don't know if I can do it. I was just not quite ready to start my slideshow. Willem, thank you so much for all your help. Um, and this is really exciting to be following um, Gabby, one of my contemporaries. Uh, I used to, as Lee mentioned, have a, a knitwear collection. I'll show you a few pictures since it's Fashion Week. I figured we should take a look for a moment, but I've really moved on. It's not that I don't want to make clothes anymore. I just would have to be hired to do so. So anyone out there and looking for a consultant who... Anyway, another story. So I work primarily in yarn, fabric, and pattern. Um, I feel like those are kind of the three big components of um, what I'm working with in various different contexts. Um, I want to say something up front, which is I'm not going to talk in detail about my new museum installation because it's about to open, and it's called Cave of Secrets. So consistent with the title, I'd like to keep it under wraps until it opens on the 27th. So this is fall 2000, just to give you a little bit of chronology, chronology of my work, but I want you to know where I was in 2000. I was showing, I had five years of doing my own knitwear collection in a really focused way. I came out of grad school at Rhode Island School of Design with a textile degree, really compelled to get into the fashion world with the knits that I was doing. I was really inspired by the APOC line by Miyaki, which at the time was radical. The idea of the um, fabric and form in one concurrent process, which is, you know, strangely not that radical because that's what hand knitting is. Um, anyway, so I did several years of clothing making beyond the kind of contained, focused 
fashion career of the runway shows and the whole kind of doing the production and the sales. And I got to a point where I was ready to move into different areas. I really wanted to expand past what the fashion market was um, asking of me at the time. So I started doing these art projects I, was, I also had started teaching at Rhode Island School of Design in the textile department as full-time faculty. Um, and I found myself in a classroom or a studio full of people sitting at knitting machines and I was teaching them to knit. And it, that work and that experience of the group knitting and being with a lot of people who were as excited about this medium as I was, that plus my continued work in knitwear then as a consultant, I had started working for brands like Gary Graham and James Coviello doing their knits. I was spending time in factories in Peru mostly. And so this, these experiences for me drove me to start this bigger project um, that happened once and it was so exciting that it had to keep happening in different iterations. So what you see here are these different of people at knitting machines producing big quantities of fabric yardage. Um, and this is a project called Knitting Nation. It's nicely documented on my website, so you can um, get kind of dig into it and see videos of these durational performances and whatnot. Um, but for this talk, I want to keep it simple and just say that it was um, a project that kind of had to end for me recently because I have lost the compulsion to perform labor. Um, at the time the project started, I really wanted people to see this process that felt alchemical to me. The knitting machines are amazing. Uh, lots of making processes feel like alchemy, um, and a lot of makers have that relationship to their media, as many of you know. And so it, part of it was about laying bare this process that I was excited, excited about, but also kind of didactically showing people the hard physical labor involved in making fabric and clothing, and also um, examining kind of the dance that humans do with machines to make things and the trance-inducing kind of choreographed movement that happens. So the project gained momentum, as you can see from these different images, and it moved out of kind of this deconstructing and reconstructing iconic textile images like the rainbow flag and the American flag and playing little games of systems into thinking about it as a kind of 3D plotting tool, like a big um, kind of structure, a mechanism that could make line color, like liquid color and quantities of, of vol voluminous color in space in all directions. So that was that. And moving on from that, because I was working so much with architecture, I started to really get into this idea that space was my new body. Like the body I was so interested in covering with clothing and creating experiences for, I segued away from that and into much bigger spaces to do kind of the same thing in a way, like create a transformative experience for the, for the in this case, viewer rather than the wearer. It's the people entering the space um, having these different visceral responses that are um, created um, to be about my visceral responses and my ideas about energy. I liked hearing Gabby's thing about the cellular level, these um, different aspects of energe energetic things. And I, I think about that a lot too in a very different way, but um, you know, this kind of like the, it's almost like life force, like the pulsing energy of, of being alive and what does that look like, but also like the extremes of emotions, anger, um, euphoria, um, agitation, you know, so th I, I have been really interested in creating these environments that are kind of both seduce and repel or seduce and or comfort and agitate 
Um, and what's at the core of a lot of my work is um, a series of dualities. And so things translate really nicely, like tension and release, or um, I mean, in this case, there's like the surface and then what's beneath. Um, decay is something that's really uh, been a kind of persistent motif. And I did a talk the other day about my, my, the kind of roots of the punk and new wave roots of my work. And there, that aesthetic and the music of that time and the fashion of that time has also been something that, that had a huge impact on my kind of aesthetic language. But at the core of it is really, um, regardless of kind of the form that the work takes, whether it's a thing that looks like a painting or an entire room, what's, what's really um, happening there is a conversation that I'm having with um, kind of traditions of pattern, um, but also like abstractions of energy. And um, optics are obviously a big thing for me and what kind of optic um, phenomena does to people. And it's, it's the kind of territory that um, I'm so interested in and I feel like I'm just kind of hovering around looking at different aspects and digging deeper and deeper into it, learning more and more, even about things like the physics of it and, and the um, like electricity and how does that all work? Like I've, um, I'm not a, really a scientific person in terms of um, a lot of the, like what I know. I never took physics in high school. I got a D in biology. I just didn't go anywhere with it. But the scientific aspects of making things and the kind of laboratory that we work in as makers and going through trials of different things with materials and the ideas behind um, some of what energy represents to me are, are like really um, kind of compelling me to go into these areas like looking at electrical towers and wanting to know like the, structurally how those actually work with the wires. And they're directly, when you see this kind of stuff here, the artwork where things are tethered together, so this idea of like relationships between people, um, people being codependent, you know, there's like, there are these layers of things that I'm looking at around um, emotional relationships and kind of psychological experiences and, but then also physically like objects being attached to each other and, and then going out into the energetic world with the electrical towers on the New Jersey Turnpike and the wires that connect them and the wires that connect all of the systems that we're dealing with in order to get stuff like this on this screen. It's very complex and mysterious to me and somehow um, making me dig in deeper. And clearly it has to do some with this fiber, kind of like all of these filaments and carriers of information, whether it's, well, I mean, in this case, the, the fiber carries color and some kind of textural property um, and some kind of performance. So I think as an artist working with yarn has been a really um, robust and kind of never endingly exciting experience because the yarn, like it's so far beyond what paint can be. Um, and I'm sure, you know, painters would have another story of an argument for why paint is such a, you know, robust medium. And I agree, but I just, yarn is, there's, it's just so amazing, the kind of range of material experiences that you can get. And also these days um, in the realm of yarn, there are plenty of yarns out there in the world that are miniature constructed textiles unto themselves. And that's a lot, this is not my work, by the way, I just want to mention so you don't think it is, it's Evie Days. She's one of my dear friends and a great artist. And I invited her to do an installation in the space. Um, 
I'll go back to that just for a second so, so I stop going on about yarn. <laughs> I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir. But um, in this space, which just closed last weekend after a two-year run, at, it was at the Tang Museum at Skidmore College in Saratoga Springs, I was invited to transform this space and make it into a lounge of sorts and an event space for the museum. And so I filled it with my art and you know special things like a custom wall-to-wall -wall carpet and kept changing the space every four or five months. And those changes included bringing in a series of different artists um, who are friends of mine and whose work I really love and seemed right for the space. And I invited each of them or, or the groups to um, create something as a response to the space and an installation in the space. So you see different things here. This is a piece by an artist named Laurel Sparks, who's a painter. And then these other pieces are um, video pieces by a duo called Scoat. And, um, you know, it's a lot of kindred spirits that I'm pulling together. And sometimes I like to say that it's the way that I force my friends to collaborate with me. <laughs> um, because everyone's always so busy. But here's a studio shot, so you see more of the yarn. I mean, like Lee said, I'm kind of one of those artists who doesn't want to be fenced in and wants to be able to kind of move wherever I need to. For many years, I was extremely loyal to weaving as a, a young right out of college or in college right out of college person, very, very deep into weaving. And then I segued into knitting and felt like deeply loyal to that and obsessed with knitting in all its different capacities. And when I was introduced to the technology of knitting jacquards and bringing in uh, imagery, like graphic imagery into constructed textiles with the knits, that was a catalytic moment for me that led me to start making these bigger artworks that have this kind of bold graphic imagery, which is work that I was dealing with for years, but then fell out of with the constructed hand loom knits because you just can't get that kind of imagery. But that was a different era and now uh, a lot more is possible, so. Anyway, this is at the Museum of Arts and Design. I, I love doing these projects that I call architectural interventions where you see something that is begging for some kind of textile construction and intervention. This stairwell at the Museum of Arts and Design is like, there. it's a loom. Um, and the first time I saw it, I felt this, like I need to weave that thing, so. <laughs> It took a while, but I got my, um, I fulfilled my dream. This is um, a, the, one of the first what I call potholder rugs, of which you've seen many in the slideshow, these big chunky um, constructions. And there's my child, Winter. So this was at a show that happened in North Carolina this summer. So um, there's this place where these chunky, rugs and woven walls and soft architecture coexist. It's like this micro and macro. Again, another duality that I'm invested in um, exploring on a kind of ongoing intuitive way. Um, it just, it feels like and it's not even like, oh, I've done this really tight work. Now it's time for me to do something loose and chunky. It just, it all has a place where these things can coexist or be strong statements on their own. Um, because I think there's, you know, it's another kind of hypnotic texture and dynamic pattern. What's really exciting to me about this whole project is the idea of taking, um, Jersey yardage and turning it into yarn. So that's what these woven constructions are, basically making this big loom um, and using the yardage, this like drapey t-shirt yardage as yarn. And then um, also with the striped fabrics, creating these interesting kind of pattern situations that manifest as a, a sort of wild camouflage 
and all the fabrics are is uh, they're they're just horizontal stripes that then compress together and kind of abstract and I love that as a beginning of another kind of pattern project. Um, here is the hand woven chunky situation but with reflective yarn. Um, that was a carpet that was in a show at Chamber this past um, spring. Um, and then here I'm moving into the last part of my talk I think which is mostly about drawing and works on paper and how um, the more art making I've done, the farther in I've gotten to returning to something I did when I was much younger, which is working on, uh, in 2D. Um, thinking about pattern and material in these same ways, but using colored pencil and literal line on paper, not to represent yarn, but to kind of create this, this same language of energy and light and space and um, electricity. And I'm thinking here sometimes even about like the light at concerts, you know, the crazy, like there's a band called Ratatat Tat and I've never seen them, but I've looked at their Instagram feed somewhere in the middle of making these and I noticed that all of the light shows look exactly like this. And that was really exciting to me as someone, you know, who spent a lot of time um, at live music events when I was younger. So here we have the drawings that you just saw that are a series called Rays, and then those translated into wall panels by a Swiss company called Four Spaces. So that's another thing I'm kind of doing a dance between is art and design, and my work going into applied design, but staying as art, and then also coexisting in installations. Um, that was not my studio in Brooklyn. It was at a residency in January in Siena, and um, I wanted to show you all these because I think it's, a, it's an interesting thing to see, you know, these are just doodles, but also drawings. Like this is my mind just kind of loosening up and um, exploring pattern in this way that is very different than the kind of um, sitting at a loom or sitting at a knitting machine making things, um, which I don't do as much anymore. I've gotten pretty deep into the kind of drawing and painting um, full circle. I mean, it's interesting when you live over 40 years and then you start to see like, here I am back in high school doing the things I was doing then, you know, and kind of traveling in these circles that keep going back and, um, you know, feeding on the same material, but in a very different life space. Um, here, explosions and these kinds of violent fissures, um, but also something about holes and sexuality somehow. And then we have this energetic mountain structure, which was the first drawing I made at that residency in January and I had just seen the Carmen Herrera show and the Agnes Martin show like the two days before I left and somehow I feel like those two kind of spirit guides infused some of my work there. Um, this is a cut paper piece that was a similar kind of just playing with line and, and color and pattern. So that's all I have for you. Um, thank you very much. I also want to apologize in advance. I can't stay for the panel. I'm very sorry. So thank you. Thank you, Liz. Um, I'm going to introduce to you a very special speaker uh, tonight. I was at a party um, a few months ago and I was speaking to a young fashion designer who was way more interested in new materials instead of shapes. So I asked him, um, what would you like to see in the New York Textile Month? And he told me, I would love to see somebody from NASA. And I was like, yes, we need somebody from NASA. Um, of course, it has like a sort of 
discreteness over it, um, the whole like space world. So I asked uh, my friend uh, Brent to reach out to NASA and just give it a try and it worked out and we're always here with us. Um, his mother was in, in uh, textile design already, so he grew up around textiles and fashion. Um, he's currently engineer for NASA, um, designing new textiles for space, uh, mostly with metals. And I'm super excited to, uh, to hear him speak. Uh. Thank you very much. Uh, this is very exciting. Um, I'll try to, sorry, I have a, ah, there you go. So I'll try to, to show you the other side or the other part of the circle uh, from this creative uh, world that you're showing. I, I've seen amazing things and I tried to perhaps show you that you know, science could be also creative as well. Um, so today will be like a short introduction of some of the things I'll explain um, to, uh, tomorrow. But I, hopefully you'll see that don't freak out, you're going to see images, nothing related to what you've seen before, but I guarantee you everything has to, is related to fabrics. So at JPL, uh, JPL stands for the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, we are a federal funded research center uh, in California. And as a NASA center, we do many, many different things, uh, from studying the Earth, uh, studying the oceans, and explore the universe. Literally, the spacecraft that go out, you know, uh, and the other uh, solar system, they're controlled by JPL and designed, most of them at JPL. And among, one of the things that we're doing as a project that I'm actually part of it is this thing here. This is a, a concept for Europa Lander. So Europa is one of the Jupiter's moons and it has a frozen, um, a frozen external uh, layer uh, about 10 kilometers of ice and then underneath uh, there is a liquid ocean of, made of water, liquid water. So we're working now on a potential mission that maybe one day we'll go there and we'll land. Yeah, so everything that you see in that concept is kind of like a little spider that will go and will land on the surface. It's possible because of fabrics. Uh, thermal blankets, as you can see on the outside, uh, some of the internal components, applications on sensors. Uh, I, I used to say, as, as William was saying, uh, that uh, fabric is one of the oldest technologies ever invented by humankind. And, and, and in space is like the, the, the you know, like a final frontier, right, for, for, for some of you geeks of uh, sci-fi like myself. Um, uh, it is the outer, the outer frontier. It's really very complicated uh, place. And so hopefully I'll show you today a couple of things. And, and again, thank you very much, William and Lee, for reminding me and participating here. And, uh, and any time, you know, I'll be available for many questions. So. This is ISS. Uh, this is the International Space Station, one of the most complicated projects ever done by humankind and the most complicated habitat ever done by humankind. Roughly, it's a spinning around Earth uh, about 300 kilometers from the surface, and in between four and six people actually live there. That project could never be done without fabrics, period. Not possible. Uh, among many other things, uh, astronauts use garments uh, to protect them, and those are made out of fabrics. Without astronauts, we cannot build this thing. So uh, the final frontier, it's there because of um, technologies that are as old as humankind. Uh, ISS is roughly to give you a sense of the size. That is like two football fields uh, in terms of size, and, and it's an international project. So uh, US is there, Russia, and, and all the European Union, as well as Japan and others. Um, so my, my job, I first started as a space architect, and, and my specialty is design habitats for astronauts. Uh, today, I do spaceship design, among other things, and I lead several uh, activities in R&D, in 3D printing, and 4D printing, as I'll show you. So perhaps this vision, uh, which is actually pretty old, um, of the future on the moon or a future on other planets is something you've seen. Well, again, fabrics are a key aspect of this. M multiple different type of fabrics that help on the inflatable side, that can help on the protection side. Uh, I'll give you a couple examples of how difficult and tough for us the space is. So there are a couple of things that we have and a couple of things we don't have among many. We don't have gravity, or if we have, it's a, it's a, it's a lower gravity. Uh, let's say if we're on the moon, we're roughly a sixth of the gravity. If we're on the Mars, it's a third. Uh, that means that your structures, everything is it's different. Potentially, you can make things bigger and ex make, make more use of the materials. But 
then again, we need to launch from Earth. And for that, we need to resist hundreds of Gs when we're, when, when, when we're or potentially hundreds when we're launching, right? So, so gravity is, is, is uh, something that is not given. It's something that changes completely. At the same time, radiation. So Earth is surrounded by a magnetic field. And that magnetic field makes us you know, look good in summer, really tan, and don't get fried like a, like a shrimp, right? But other places don't have that, and certainly this space doesn't have that. If you go to the moon, there's no such a thing. If you go to Mars, nothing. Um, again, fabrics are solutions that help us uh, in, that, in that regard, and I'll show you a couple examples. But there's another thing. Here, usually, well, I guess in New York, it's easier. I live in LA, so you know, streets are, most of the time, they're empty, uh, or just cars. But here, you're walking in the street, and something could fall, you know, Know, on top of you, right? Uh, in a space, certainly that happens all the time. We have micrometroids, they're really very small, but have a lot of kinetic energy, and they literally can penetrate pretty much everything we have. So having different techniques in order to protect against us, that's also very critical. And fabrics, again, are an important aspect of it. Think like bulletproof uh, vests, right? Very similar technology, try to diffract and, and, and disperse the energy of, of a high velocity impact. So these are some of the examples that tomorrow I'll talk to about those are ceramic fabrics that are used uh, in uh, different applications. That goes from astronaut garments to protection of thermal blankets in, in, uh, in spacecraft, um, as well as uh, protection of robotic systems as well. Uh, then again, dust, uh, micrometroids, all those kind of things that, that here on Earth we have different ways to handle, we don't have. At JPL, we develop robotic missions mainly. That means we send something to Mars, we send something to, uh, to Europa, and those things many times need to perform different uh, functions on themselves because there is a time difference between Earth and there. That means we need to really make them uh, really tough. And at the same time, if they got broken, no one can go and fix it. So no, you have to, you have to make sure that works, right? Uh, so this is the environment that, that, that uh, we worked in. Uh, actually, this is one of the easiest that we have. So in, in here, what you can see is uh, it's a bunch of astronauts. This is part of ISS, and, and one of the phases where um, we were building, uh, I think it was the um, uh, west wing of it. And um, as you can see there in this environment, we have more radiation than here, but we're still protected. We have micrometeorites. We don't have gravity. And uh, we have the sun in extreme temperature. So between the shade, as you, you can see there, the shadow, and then the sun, there are hundreds of uh, Celsius degrees of difference. Materials need to be able to adapt and to be able to withstand the thermal shock. And then again, that imagine like a piece of aluminum, sometimes that it's difficult to make it, to handle that, right? So we have other techniques, like for instance, create like shades, and then again, fabrics are in crucial part of it. So as you can see there, not only fabrics with the people, but also fabrics with the systems. Uh, and then again, on filters and other things like that, uh, that, that part is critical. I always thought that as a designer, um, when you design something, knowing the material you have makes a big difference because it makes, makes it real. Doesn't matter if you build it or not. The point is you can, right? And you can because you know how it works. Um, in this case, uh, understanding materials uh, got integrated very much, not only with the material itself, but with the geometry. So around two years ago, we started, uh, my team and I, we started um, to work on a project to try to think if we can program functions within the materials. If we can combine geometry and materials, mainly using metal, to try to apply uh, and integrate multiple functions into one system that will be easy to integrate it, right? We call that, you see maybe 4D printing or 3D printing, in essence, is using additive manufacturing um, uh, or different additive manufacturing techniques but also use very interdisciplinary uh, uh, design techniques and trying to understand how it works from the physics side, from the electronic side, from the thermal side, the mechanical, and so forth. So I'll give you a, a little example that maybe you see in the media. So this was uh, a 3 printed fabric, and I guess one of the reasons why I'm here. Uh, um, so this was, we developed this a year and a half ago, and the point of, of, of this um, fabric, I think I could, you can see a video better. And actually, I have here something. So at least you could you could see it how it moves later. So this is as it comes from a printer. This is metal. This is uh, made out, out of steel. But we have, we play with different type of materials and 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 combinations of materials. The idea was uh, could we build something highly adaptable 
uh, that potentially could be used to build large things, let's say antennas, let's say reflectors, let's say anything else you, you can think of, but it could be built in space. And it has to be adaptable uh, for two reasons. One, we're bringing the matter, the material with us, um, so um, we're bringing the raw material or getting the raw material up there. Um, we need to have, uh, we need to have uh, a knowledge on how the geometry is going to perform uh, under different conditions. And then let's see how many functions we could accomplish, but it's one cr critical thing. You cannot bring a loom with you, right? It's going to be too complicated. So it has to be a technique that allows us to create different geometries, and at the same time, that is fairly simple, and potentially to a low energy process. Because energy is kind of like the big deal in space. So we don't have much, and whatever you have, you need to, to, to use it properly. So in the end, we end up going into fabrics kind of like uh, as a natural solution. And while technically, well, it is, it is an interwoven fabric, but uh, it's more like a lace in this case. Uh, the idea was, uh, could we combine at least four functions? It has to be something that, that is able to adapt to any, 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 any shape, anything you want to do, right? At the same time, it has to be strong. So it has to resist, and obviously resist much more than, than me just pulling, right? We're talking about Gs of, of force. And, at this, and, um, and it has to be able to reflect electromagnetic waves. In this case, uh, be, uh, light, right? So as you can see, you know, it reflects. And this is how it comes from the printer. But on the other hand, because we're in space, and as I said before, the things we don't have, one of the things we don't have is air. We don't have air. Because we don't have air, there is no convection. It means if something gets hot, it gets hot. And the only way to get rid of that heat is either radiating or, or touching something that is colder than you are. Uh, as a consequence, since you don't have wind, it's like you cannot have one of those things. You know, and you're, oh, I get hot and I just, a breeze will come and I'll be okay. You cannot do that. So the geometry of the material needs to be done in a way that, uh, that acts as a radiator. So the backside of this, actually, it's what it is. Um, let's say that I'm, I'm looking at the sun, literally at this light here, and this, this side is, is it's, uh, reflecting the light, but it's heating up, right? So the other side that is looking at cold space, literally, you know, the dark side of the room, that has to re radiate that energy, and that's pretty much what, what this thing does. Um, so we'll talk a little more in detail tomorrow, but in essence, um, it, this was the first generation. We're already working on a, a second and third generation that integrate other functions that, as William was saying, I, we cannot tell yet, uh, eventually. Um, but this to me was very poetic in a way because uh, it made you rethink certain things. And I always, every time, I, since I started working in aerospace, I, I realized that going into that, that uh, final frontier is rethinking many things. Uh, uh, in this case, it's rethinking fabric, one of the oldest technologies. If one day we go back to the moon or to Mars or to other places and we use caves, we'll rethink our habitats, reinventing the caves. So in many ways, it's that cycle that, that Liz was, was saying. Uh, and that cycles, I think, is part of life, right? It's part of improving ourselves in one way or the other. So, um, so I hope that tomorrow I can show you more things, and I'll be available for any questions. And and that's um, that's what I have um, that's what I have today. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Just see Gabby at NASA. <laughs> huh? It's amazing how much correlation there is in the way of thinking and from very different points of view. Uh, this whole idea of geometry in the world of textile, I think, is yet to be better explored, actually. It's only sort of recently that you keep, um, that people keep talking about this more and more. We are very happy today to have a friend of mine from the Netherlands um, who is going to be in our Talking Textiles uh, seminar tomorrow, but she was uh, filling in for a speaker who couldn't come. And um, she's going to share with you her journey through the world of textiles and artisans. She um, is an educator. She is an entrepreneur. She had many different uh, fashion lines, always very creative and in the box, not out of the box. She would sell men's shirts with artist 
patterns in cigar boxes, I remember. Uh, so her idea is very much to be in the box, and the box is making her so creative. And like a cat or a baby, you know, they always go in the box, so I think. It's always better to say in the box than out of the box. In any case, um, her crea creativity has no boundaries. And at one point she was um, upset with the state of affairs in fashion and took a sabbatical, started to travel, started to record the travels, and then she never stopped. And then years later suddenly uh, is on my desk this amazing journey in a book. And the book is so personal and so spectacular that She's self-publishing, but I think it's almost sold out. I mean, it's, you will enjoy the journey. She's going to show a snippet of this uh, idea and especially also explain to you what it did to her as a person. Birgitta de Vos. Thank you, Lee, for inviting me here. Just throwing me in at the deep. <laughs> uh, and doing a talk here, which actually I'm going to do tomorrow. I don't know how many of you are going to be there tomorrow. But uh, I'm going to do a little short talk, maybe different, just out of my head. And uh, thank you for all the, the other speakers before. They were so impressive that I actually don't dare to speak at all anymore. <laughs> But I'm going to show you the movie, which is out of the book. And the voice of the movie is from a shaman out of Peru. And actually, what also was impressive was by hearing these first three speakers, they were so fast in their speaking, they were so eager to go to the future, actually. Um, and that's just the opposite what I experienced. Actually, that was also why I went out of fashion, because the fashion movement was going so fast, faster and faster. And the opposite happened when I, when I traveled and saw all these people working in the, uh, well, traditionally, all over the world. I'm going to show you some, well, the movie with some pictures out of the book. Pachacama su team, Wiracocha su team, Pinatatka. Madre tierra, Mother Earth. We are your children, Mother. And listen to our prayer. Listen to our song.
Jesus has come to this world, Mother, from your womb, and to live in this world in harmony. And I don't know why, Mother, today we fight and we destroy you, Mother. Please, Mother, I want to live in harmony with you. Help me, Mother, to understand myself and to understand you. I don't want to fight with you, Mother, but please, please, Mother, help me to live in harmony with you. Please. Mankind, let me guide them, mother. Let me guide them, mother. Let me tell them, mother, that they must learn from woman. At least they will know how to treat. They will know how to share life, mother. So please, mother, let me spread the message, mother, around the world so we can save you, mother. So we can take care of you, mother. So we can learn how to love you, mother. Please, mother, listen my prayer. Spirit. I pray to you, Great Spirit, because we want you to be here close to us, Great Spirit, close to our heart. We want you to show us the right path. We want the light, the way, and the life. We don't want to fight in your name, Great Spirit. Nowadays, religions, sects, dogmas are pulling us some take our arms, some our feet, some our head. They are all fighting. They cannot live in peace, great spirit, because of your name. They have created world, great spirit because of your name. We don't want that, Great Spirit. We want 
a world of three down. We Indians want to keep taking care of this planet, great spirit. You are the light. You choose us to take care of this planet, great spirit. Thank you to our ancestors. We still think on taking care of this planet you created. Listen to our prayer. the spirit great the spirit I pray to you great the spirit because we want you to be here close to us great the spirit close to our heart We want you to show us the right path. We want the light, the way, and the life. you. Actually, when I went out of fashion after more than thir no, three de decades working in the fashion industry, I went on this retreat. I didn't want to have anything to do with fashion anymore. And then I went traveling and making pictures. And then after 10 years, two years ago, one, one and a half, two years ago, I looked at my pictures and I saw that there were so many pictures having something to do with textiles. And well, the book, that's how the book came together. And I had a very hard time getting the book out. I just asked first my publisher and then I tried, in the end I did it myself. And then the book was out and then it started talking to people. And now I'm standing here, and it's only, well, six months ago, and it's selling all over the world. And I find myself in fashion again, but from a total different way, from a total different angle, which is actually surprises me in a way, because I didn't, I didn't want to have anything to do with the world anymore, with this world anymore. But what I realized also, that when I was quiet, I heard the textiles speaking to me. They were talking. And what I realized also, that we are now in a totally different, in the 21st century, we are totally in a different time and age than we were in the 20th century, when the industrialization of textiles came into being. And it ended up as a marketing tool where a lot of people were going to make money and more money, more money, and faster and faster. And well, this actually is in a decline since the crisis. It's everywhere, shops are closing, people don't want this anymore. People want to be in touch with themselves again. So they want to, well, I kept on thinking like, 
maybe you've seen it also that you have to fill in some forms on the internet is saying like, I'm not a robot. And well, that's the way we are going to be if it's the I, how you call it, artificial intelligence. So there's this movement that computers and human beings are going to be the same. So it's a singularity. And that is moving up very fast. So where are we then? What are we as human beings? Why are we here on Earth? And what can we do? And I discovered actually that we are creative beings. That is our creativity that makes us who we are and makes us different from other people. And if we don't use it, if we buy happiness and well-being in a shop, then it leaves us empty inside. So we have to use our creativity and we have to use it wherever we can. And seeing these people, these artisans working with their hands, it made me also work, work with my hands again. And well, that, that makes a difference because I do it totally different now than I did it 30 years ago. 30 years ago, I was, it's more an ego thing. I wanted to be out in the world to be seen. And now it's more like I'm doing it with awareness that what I'm doing and there's something else in me makes it happening. So actually I do one step back. So it's more that it's happening and it can only be happening if you step into your creativity. And so at this moment in the 21st century, we have the occasion, we have the opportunity. There's so much possibility to start all over again. So maybe we can learn from these artisans to start all over again and look at fashion again or textiles again. How do we make things? And so actually the whole textile, um, new textile program Lee is setting up is very important because then we start to do it again ourselves and discover our creativity again and feed our soul instead of feeding our ego. So tomorrow I will have a much more in-depth presentation, but this is it for now. Thank you. That was wonderful, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, sometimes you um, are being brought in touch with someone that is filled with pure goodness. And I was introduced to Simone last year. Uh, he also gave a lecture as part of the New York Textile Month. Um, and he was willing to collaborate, he was willing to come, willing to explain his story to the audience here in New York. And um, he's with us again tonight. I'm um, very proud again. Um, Simone is uh, the founder of the Ethical Fashion Initiative, which was um, founded, let me see, 2009. Um, what he's doing is he is actually setting up productions in developing countries to cater directly to the luxury industry. Um, he's working with many famous brands that are uh, working in an ethical way with um, these artisans in these African, and I think not only Africa, but all around the world, um, to do it in a fair way. And I think that's a very beautiful way of making the production um, ethical. Um, he just came from Geneva, um, so we are very happy that he's here. He was stuck in traffic from the airport, but he's still here and he made it. Uh, thank you so much, Simone. I would like to invite you on stage. Um, some good words with my wife. She has a different opinion of mine. Simon, do you Mama mean with mia, the which one? Or with titles? I don't know which one it is. I'm too old. Uh, let's see. Huh. 
What is that? Ah, uh, does it go on the screen? Yeah. yeah, it's here. Mamma mia, you see it. So usually I walk when I present because I'm, I'm, I'm not capable to stay still, but in this setting I have to stay still. Lee Willem, thank you for having me here, for having this Mephistophelic face to join your angelic beings. And now, <laughs> what do you laugh? <laughs> Nothing, I'm very serious. I am a UN officer, would you believe it? Uh, I work, I founded this thing, Ethical Fashion, uh, some years ago uh, to use fashion as a vehicle of poverty reduction and empowerment of women, what we do. We work with artisans in many developing nations in order to enable them to become permanent suppliers of fashion and interior brands. In a nutshell, to produce work, to produce jobs, to produce dignity. In we do a lot of things in the area of textile. We work in Burkina Faso, we work in Mali, and we work in other Western African countries where we have recovered the traditional weaving skills and we have transformed them into something which is uh, extremely important for the industry of fashion. We work in Burkina Faso, we work in Mali, which are a home of typical weaving traditions, and we have simply taken this tradition to the 21st century by modifying slightly the tools and the systems of people in order to enable them to become productive and to become suppliers of big companies. In a very simple way, uh, this is a, a, a large loom, a pedal and a flying shuttle loom, which has completely changed the way in which you weave in Burkina Faso. It has changed that because traditional weaving in the region was strip weaving, very narrow strips of fabric, which were difficult to be used by companies to produce accessories, garments, uh, upholstery, and so on. So we recovered these larger looms, which were available, and I will tell you why, and we introduced them by creating a sort of uh, a work environment in which people can collaborate together and can become a supply chain. I won't go into detail of the business model. I want to focus on weaving and all the skills associated to weaving, dyeing, using natural dyes, decoration, printing, and everything. You must know that weaving in the region uh, is traditionally an activity for men, and is traditionally a factor of exclusion for women. In Burkina Faso, during the 80s, uh, during the 80s, there was a visionary leader, a revolutionary leader, Thomas Sankara, who decided to adopt these wider looms in order to enable women to weave. Women were weaving with vertical looms, which were uh, not so productive. So uh, thanks to the work of some people, they uh, developed a new loom, a horizontal one with pedal, which was more suitable for the body and the posture of women. Starting from that, with the introduction of the wider loom, women started developing their own skills and their own businesses. They became active part of society. Society. Thomas Sankara promoted education for all women, which were excluded from school at a very young age. And this has created a very strong society. Burkina Faso has gone through revolution recently, uh, difficult moments, but the country has remained together and cohesive uh, just because of that, because of the fact that everybody participates in society and weaving, weaving, women weavers are a fundamental part of that. Uh, that part of Africa is stricken by 
the, one of the diseases of the world of today, which is terrorism. These Islamo mafias, because they are mafias, eh? they have nothing to do with religion. These Islamo mafias who have created uh, a lot of businesses, human trafficking, drug trafficking, and all the rest in these countries are, are trying to destabilize these countries in order to have a free hand in them. Burkina is very difficult to be destabilized because women participate fully in society and it's a very strong society, so much so that even the recent terrorist attacks were not able to destabilize that. We also work in Mali, another beautiful country of the region. Uh, where there are a lot of problems because of terrorism, war, and all the rest. I'm telling you a thing. Where we work, in the communities where we work, in the communities of weavers, where the artisans work all together, we are not affected by that. There's a town in northern Mali, Mopti, where people cannot go because of terrorism. We go there and we don't even wear our bulletproof jacket that we wear in other places because we are part of the fabric of society. Thanks to weaving, this is a, a, a tartan that we developed for Vivian West with one of our partners. This is our chief weaver. So we use a lot of natural dyes. And we have developed this fabric, this traditional artisanal product into something which is part of beautiful collections. In order to have it part of beautiful collections, of course, you need to have good partners. One of our main partners is United Arrows, a brand in Japan uh, whose creative director is an incredible visionary. Uh, you know him very well, Lee. Irofumi Kurino, Kurino-san. He is a visionary. He is a person who thinks out of the box, really. He came to Africa with us, and he created a new brand within United Arrows in order to commercialize our products. Nowadays, the fabric that we weave in Burkina Faso and in Mali is part of wonderful suits for men within the collections of United Arrows. Some of the most beautiful suits for men I've seen in my life. These are the leaves and all the processes that we use when we have to uh, do the dyeing, the dyeing processes. We try to use natural dyes as more as possible because they are beautiful, they are pure, they have an incredible touch. But here, in the industry of fashion of today, you have a problem. The industry of fashion of today is characterized by one feature. The majority of people in it don't know how things are made. They don't know it, and especially designers. You find often designers, young or old, it doesn't matter, who ask you to produce incredible quantities uh, manually, when you weave manually, or who ask you to have a product with the same physical characteristics of an industrially made piece of fabric. And this is one of the first problems. Uh, when you have uh, natural dyes, when you have an artisanal product, you have something in which you see the hands of the artisan, something which is not perfectly consistent, but which is beautiful. Of course, the properties are different. Of course, uh, some of these dyes uh, can fade away with time. They have to be stabilized. So in order to work in this strange industry, we have engaged in stabilizing this kind of dyes in creating processes that allow artisans to produce their own products and to have a dialogue to be part of the supply chain of this industry. Uh, while working with artisans, we also work, uh, these are all the things that we do in our, in, our, in our laboratories in Burkina Faso and in Mali. While working with artisans, we work also with artists. You know that fabric, 
textile traditions are part of cultures. They are incredibly strong identity building factors. In the museum of Bamako, in the National Museum in Bamako in Mali, you have some pieces of textile or fabric which date to the 12th century and they are exactly the same of the ones that you have today. It's a factor of identity in that culture. But in the world of today, we need to bring together identities and to create new identities. We need to evolve. The world of today has incredible challenges, inequality, insecurity, but the biggest of all is division. And the industry of fashion is part of this division because the industry of fashion has mostly failed to bring together together cultures, to create dialogue among different cultures, so much so that in this industry today, you hear more and more talks about cultural exploitation, cultural misappropriation, exploitation of people. Art is a different thing. Art brings cultures together, and I'm very happy today I saw artists here presenting their work. The art brings cultures together in a harmonious way, creates a plan of dialogue and allows artisans to have a, a say, to be part of that. This is Abubakar Fofana, a great indigo artist. Indigo is one of these incredible dyes used all over Western Africa. It started in Northern Nigeria. It's widely used in Mali. Some people of Western Africa are identified by the color of indigo. Think about the Tuareg, the blue people. Abubakar Fofana has transformed this craft into a form of art. This summer we have organized an installation in Beaux-Arts, which is a beautiful museum in Brussels. And while we were setting up this installation, Abu had an installation in Kassel, a documenta, which is the main, the main exhibition appointment for contemporary art worldwide. Uh, while we were setting up this installation in the museum, there was an exhibition of a great artist of the 20th century, a great French artist, Yves Klein, Yves Le Monochrome, who was known for his blue. I'm telling you, the dialogue in between the installation of, Abubaka, of Abubakar and the works of Yves Klein was incredible. And now I want to close with another point. Yeah, okay, these are our things. This is, oh, mom, mom, mommy, I made a mistake. Uh, <laughs> it happens. Uh, uh, my wife would say that this is normal with me. <laughs> we work with migrants. We work with migrants. Uh, there's a huge flow of migration from Africa and from the Middle East to Europe. The governments are worried. There are tensions in societies. Xenophobic parties are on the rise. People say that we have to build walls. In Italy, the country where I was born, there is a huge debate on how to close the frontiers. No debate, or a very small one, on how to favor dialogue and mutual understanding, mutual knowledge, integration. Well, I'm telling you a thing. We have a center for migrants in Italy. We saw all this coming up. We work in Africa. We work in Western Africa, in Eastern Africa. Then I work in Haiti. I work in Afghanistan, in Syria, in many places. But we said, listen, all this world where we work is coming to us, to Europe. We have to do something here. So we are people who work in the supply chain of fashion. We created a place where we make bags and where we weave. And the fashion brand, uh, I shouldn't disclose it, but I will, uh, <laughs> as an act of goodwill, uh, uh, which is Fendi came to us and said, can we do something together? And I said, look, we are not very good yet in this place, but we can stitch 
the dust bags of your art, the dust bags in which you put your beautiful products. So we started stitching them and we started weaving something also for another brand. And what is incredible is that we created this center by putting together these migrants with some artisanal skills because they come from a culture, because these skills are a part of their culture, with artisans from Italy. I was born in Italy. I was born in Italy. I, I, I look like Methuselah, but I was born in Italy not very long ago. And, and when I was a boy, everybody in my place was an artist. And I was born in Tuscany, which is the best part of Italy and the only real part of Italy. The rest of Italy is a rough copy of Tuscany. And the Italian language comes from Tuscany. The best olive oil is from Tuscany, even the best one. Well, uh, you, you know it. Yeah. And everybody was an artisan working for Ferragamo, working for Gucci, working for this or that brand. People very proud of their skill. So we brought together these migrants, these artisans, with local artisans. I'm telling you, it's an incredible experience because these guys using the hands without speaking the language, they just connected, they just clicked together and started working together in the place where we have created this small center which is on the mountains above Bologna, which is not Tuscany, above Bologna, in there, there is no conflictuality whatsoever with local people, in between local people and migrants. Weaving, fashion can be, but fashion is, good, is doing bad. Weaving, textile, are factors to build, are, are a tool to build a better society, a different fabric of society. Thank you. all very moving and it's beautiful also how the all things correlate and how they come together because this is exactly what we want to address for the future of textiles and our MFA. I'm going to try to explain where we want to go with this uh, new venue, this initiative. It's difficult because it's not yet there. So I, I'm going to illustrate it with things which I gathered. So it's more a projection than reality what which will come. It's really more of a frame of mind. But since I always work with pictures, I felt it was interesting still to illustrate my thoughts. Uh, it's called MFA Textiles, unfortunately, because I wanted to call it Textiles Unlimited, but that's not possible in the United States. You would not get accreditation because it's much too fancy. <laughs> uh, so hopefully in the future we will be able to carry this name as a sort of sub-brand, uh, but officially I could not um, be so daring. But our seminar today is called uh, Textiles Unlimited. I liked it because it says that we have unlimited possibilities, unlimited possibilities. But there's also this idea of business unlimited. It has a bit of a sort of business echo. And um, this idea about textile being unlimited, I think that is the, the core of where we will go in the 21st century. In the beginning of time, almost everything was made from textile. Communication was with textile, with flags and banners. A transport was with textile, with, with sails and um, sort of vehicles which were covered in textile. Um, everything we were carrying was in textile. So textile was very much <coughs> in the basis of our everyday life. Of course, we had clothes. And then the houses used to be textiles and tents and dwellings. And even if it was like a half-built house, then there was still a lot of textile to prevent um, the weather to come in. So textile was completely, completely interwoven with everyday life. 
And then came, of course, the mechanization and then the industrialization and then came wood and metal and stone and plastic. And by and large, textile was renegated to become a decorative craft meant for beautiful interiors and beautiful clothes or functional clothes, but no longer was part of this total picture. It was fine. There was there's amazing things made in these centuries of study and making and researching. And when you go, to, for instance, to the Lyon Museum of Textiles, we could see one day the the different uh, things in the archives. You just you know f you faint of the beauty of things. You, know, you faint of the they open a drawer you know, and there's a dress which is pleated in linen, in tea color, and very small little arms, Isimiyaki. It's an Egyptian dress. Or there's a small little cardigan. It's a beautiful pattern. Missoni, it's from the Middle Ages. So there is all these sort of incredible sort of pieces in this history of textile. But now we see that there is this opportunity, and I think with NASA we will even um, expand this opportunity to bring textiles again into transportation. There is a new car made from linen, just now out in, um, in Eindhoven. And there is, um, I think, the growing interest in using, again, textile in housing, in part of the housing or completely in housing, especially wool is predicted to be a very important building element. There is uh, the idea of sort of press pressing, pressuring materials together into new hardware. There is the comeback of textile really in seating and in the organization of public space. There is the presumption that we will be able to be uh, crochet buildings with robots we, which will just build itself, you know. There is the idea that we will be able to knit bridges there is this um, knowledge, sort of, it's not completely 100% confirmed, but there's pockets of information so much and so certain that we will see that textile might become the, the fabric of the 21st century. And it's not only coming back with, with a vengeance, but it's going to expand. And so possibly somewhere around 2050, 60, 60 to 70 percent of, of, of matter will be textile or fiber minded. And this is also because we are creating new fiber, we are creating new resources. We need to clean up also the shit of the planet, so we will use a lot of that also to create uh, other fibers and textiles. So it's, we are on this moment, this threshold, this, this, where you can have this vision where suddenly um, it would not be just an MFA, it would be a school, because you would do, you know, architecture, you do art, you do theater, you do design, and, you know, there is a, there is a vast uh, array of possibilities for the future. That makes me very happy, because I'm really a textile lover. The exhibition last year in the Met, which was about man and machine, showed us how intrinsically related is the past and with the future. And how the skills of the hands of the past are now sometimes transposed in the skills of the computer, but somehow are still very, very much related. And my feeling is that futurism can only exist when it is deeply rooted in the past. Otherwise, it will just miss a beat. We will see, this is Gabi's work and another designer from the Netherlands, which is a fiber piece of um, furniture. We will see that we will go from the very, very primitive use of fiber, almost brut, shamanistic, to this other very um, sort of interesting and sort of complex world of 3D printing. And I remember, Gabi, that you said in another discussion that you think it is the lycra of the 21st century, because it has all these possibilities to move every other way. 
So it will correlate with the people in the future, which will be people which are transforming all the time themselves. We will go into history, because history means research, and we will want to understand historic movements and how we can take ideas, um, inspiration, and bring this history into the future. We will work on the philosophy of textiles to understand why textile is here, what textile is doing, how is it possible that textile is actually a blueprint of society. It's so amazing that when you look at the dominant fabric of a period and you analyze the fabric, you can understand what the culture and the economy of that period was. I discovered this uh, when we went from the 80s to the 90s. In the 80s, the dominant fabric was a diagonal weave. Everything was made in the diagonal weave. All the Japanese black uh, clothes were made in this weave. This weave is um, not honest because it's, it's able to weave very bad stuff and then make it look beautiful. So, you know, you take a viscose and you weave it, a lousy quality, and it looks like wool until you sit on it and then you know it's not. And it's the same with the twill, with the scarves, you can make a cotton even look like silk. So it's a facade weave. Well, in the 80s, we had facade buildings. We had facade organizations which, which were laundering money. Everything in the 80s, especially in the second part, was a facade and a farce. So in fact, the, the construction of the fabric was absolutely right on with society. And then I remember so vividly, we went from the 80s to the 90s, almost like turning a page. And here we were. We felt so guilty of the excess, always running around this golden calf. We just felt so guilty of the waste. We just wanted to think of ecology and we wanted to create a new economy because we had an economic crisis, ecological crisis. So everybody, the only thing we wanted to see is a square weave, one up, one down. So with the square weave, you cannot, you cannot trick because you, it, you, know, you see all of them as much. So this is where the, for the first time also in political discourse, the word honesty was suddenly uttered didn't last long, unfortunately, but it was a moment. So it's so interesting to see that even the, the construction of cloth is able to somehow convey who we are, where we are, and so on. Then we want to speak about the anthropological studies, which is a new strategic study. I believe that we will be able to work together with the students to see what is the correlation between us humans and our fabrics. How do we interact? Why do we choose certain qualities more than others? What is this intimacy? What is this need people have? How will this need change? And so somehow I feel that uh, anthropology will be, let's say, the new marketing, like a scientific marketing, which is not out to create gain, but is out to create beauty and wellness for people. We want to be there. Also, I want, personally, I'm very interested in archaeology, which is the exploration of the beginning of time. I think it's, it's very dominant now in art. I, I keep seeing it also in design, the fragmentation, the excavation. New, new things are made as if they are archaeological finds. And maybe I think this is because we feel quite um, troubled about being human today with the barbaric situation which we are in, with the administrations we don't deserve. Um, it's somehow very hard to believe in uh, humanity today. And when you go back and you go to an ethnic and anthropological museum, somehow you can again feel you know, how beautiful it is to be human how great it is to be human, what we humans did to sort of design our way into existence. Therefore, I think it's at this point in time very necessary to go back that far. 
On the left is the oldest pair of pants found somewhere in Mongolia. I found it very moving because, um, first of all, the scientist uh, discovered that this was, must have been a um, horse rider because it's uh, protecting the genitals. But what I find so beautiful is that there's already the strips of uh, fantasy wovens and finishes. So at such an early point, there is already this notion of embellishment, of ritualization, of um, being part of a region or a tribe. On the right, it's a contemporary piece, but somehow they seem to be made for each other. And this is where I think we will have a lot of uh, rhetoric about this. On the left is the oldest shoe found. It looks like an espadrille. On the right, it's a current shoe. So we see that there is this interest in the undone, the unmade, the fragmented, and so on. We are, I think, interested also in the way um, people used to work with the ancestor knowledge and the traditions of a region, the felting, the patterning, and so on. And I think it, it, it needs to be explored to be then transmitted to the future. And uh, it possibly will give very different uh, notions of clothes, notions of interiors, notions of usages. Definitely jacquards will be part of this picture. And then we see that young designers are designing sort of fragmented tools, which almost look like tools from that period, but they're not. And then we see these new wovens, which are inclusive of hard fragmented material. Definitely we see and believe in the comeback of the loom in a quite massive way. And we will have a lot of looms to um, have our students work on. There is a regain of interest to go from the loom to upholstering. So we definitely want to work with American and international brands. And hopefully some of the students will become gifted designers for interior. We will discover the loom to be a um, process which inspires multiple uh, applications, also unusual applications, transparencies. We believe that the loom will become so important that it will also create installations, art, fiber art, and clothing. We think, we saw it in the word, work of Liz, is that every grid somehow is inviting to be um, closed with yarn. We think that there is going to be a huge impact of um, uh, the new technologies of stitching and quilting, and knitting and so on, the layering, the double weaving. This is from Pratt. We think that uh, knitted environments will become important again. Now they are still knit knits, but in the future they might be knitted with hard materials and carbon fibers and so on. This is the first ever chair which is baked like a cookie. So I found that interesting also. This is sort of, it's a sort of pasta. And it goes into a bamboo box and then it goes into oven and then when it's ready, it's, it has the right, it's al dente, it's, you know, you can sit in it. Uh, there's a lot of talk about burning and uh, heating and so there is, I think, a whole new field of cooking textiles. There is also this idea that textiles can become completely high tech so they can formulate and form already the final uh, shape. So this could be housing, this could be pavilions, this could be a temporary pop-ups, this can be interiors and so on. The past for us is the present. So we want to look at techniques from the past, uh, realizations from the past, but also methods of the past. And we see now in the Hudson Valley near New York, but it's happening I think all over the world, that there is this keen interest in sheep, in wool, but also goats, 
and that there is a growing market for the farms around New York to bring their woolens to the city, to the designers here. And uh, now also there is the knowledge that, that it's not only the type of sheep, but it's also the, what you give them to eat, which is inspiring the best woolens and so. So it's, there's more and more building up knowledge which we have lost. The other day we spoke with the director of the American wool mill. He is crazy about bringing wool to the United States. But he says it doesn't need to be Italian wool, it needs to be American wool. We need to find out what that is, you know, how does that work. And so there is this uh, recognizing, I think, also the, the roots of certain materials, which are different in different places in the world. In this case, it's very interesting. This is a, a, a collective in, uh, between Brooklyn and Hudson Valley, Friends of Light. They create made-to-measure jackets, which are 150 to more, 280 hours of weaving, uh, based on an old uh, technique from the Incas. But what is interesting that it's couture, so it's woven completely to measure. Never happened before, strangely. This is definitely what Gabrielle Chanel would have done if would she have lived now. So this is the type of initiatives we see now coming into the world and uh, f uh, suddenly wool becomes again a very important factor also for footwear. And wool of course is amazing for interior because it's flame resistant and wool has so many properties that we have neglected in favor of synthetics, but basically it's water repellent also and so on. So we see that wool is coming back in the active wear section. So wool is, gets re-sought, reconstructed, rewoven, reused, uh, more detailing in the type of flock to create the type of aspects. And this is true also with uh, other regions of the world we, where we are studying the roots of the uses and then we see how we can bring that into another more free language. There is definitely the emancipation of fiber. Fiber has been fixed in these textiles for so long that now they really want to break free. And this is why we see all this fringe and all this cut, you know, all these jeans and all these fibers are fed up with being hold on to. So we will be in a, in a long period of wildness of fiber, but also the use, of course, of mud cloths and um, new embellishments. Very intriguing um, graduate from the Design Academy is creating textiles from with earth. She makes a 3D grid and then she helps the roots of corn to create uh, earth textiles. It's incredibly beautiful, it's incredibly moving. It means that textile actually will leave also its immediate sort of purpose and become part of gardening or maybe food preparation or I have no idea where it will go. It will go far. The creation is going to be very singular and we hope to recruit the type of student which wants to go there. As we said, the fiber is so free that fiber art is sort of sprouting again. And the fiber is sometimes, uh, um, let's say, enlarged out of proportion. The fiber is also used uh, for very free types of knitting and assembling. The, there's interactions between inventions of industry and um, the use for interiors. This is the fly knit of Nike, which is used for the shoes, which obviously is a technique which is going to go everywhere uh, and which can create, I don't know, lingerie, I think would be amazing. And then there will be, sh will be uh, furniture and cars and so on. Then with um, the uh, New York City studios, we are going to partner with our students. So every Friday, the students will go to one of the creative uh, people in this area and work in their studio, work on their own work, 
but also sometimes co-work in the studio, see what it is real life, how to work with industry, how to integrate an equipe, how to make a mood board, how to make a scenario, how to, how to buy yarns, how to create. And that is sort of like a stage internship, which is spread out uh, over the two years. So it's going to be a gift, I think, for students because they will meet the most incredible creative persons in this world. Doing each their very different thing from uh, preparing for industry and uh, very important colorist or to amazing structural weaves or to amazing embroideries and so on. Janine Han, who is here today, she is also faculty in Parsons and she is specialized in the using of conductive yarns which can make sound. So her creations uh, enable us to think of a future where actually we would make fabric which then you could dance and you could um, have theater and opera and make your own uh, music, um, which is super exciting. Then we are going to look for new qualities to have new learning and we are going to biomimic, I think, often things or take things directly from nature or work together with nature or find things we have forgotten in nature. I think that insects uh, are very interesting to follow to see how color is distributed. We now know that there is the new spider silk, which is the DNA of spiders, which is grown in San Francisco. This is going to be a revolution because it might wipe out all synthetics if this works. There's five sorts of um, strands of silk. One of them, the one to make the web, is super stretched. So imagine that we can make that in a lab and have that then we don't need all, this, all these terrible things anymore. So to be followed, uh, there is going to be an opening this month uh, in Stella McCartney's shop. She has made some garments in the first ever fabric made uh, from spider silk without spiders. But that means obviously that we could make many other um, animal and maybe plant uh, fiber in a new way. But there's also things like the use of um, um, seaweed. We have too much of it, it's actually a problem. So it would be very cool if we would develop more the use of seaweed in fiber. We have, um, for instance, pine tree is here used to do um, collections. You, especially young groups of people uh, in Europe, we see them all going to whatever sort of material, trees, they take the bark of trees and then they embroider so it becomes a sort of manipulable fabric. So there is this huge interest in deriving new matter, including our own matter, hair. There's several uh, graduation projects in the world using hair. It's a sustainable source, so it's actually a very interesting idea. Then there is uh, um, an enormous progress in the making of new textiles which can prevent us from killing animals. This um, graduate, she, she uses fiber, loose fiber, and then it's, it's embroidered and stitched on a sort of um, skin type ground, so it really becomes very close to uh, skin, but it isn't. She will have a great future in the luxury industries. The luxury industries are now asking my office in Paris and my colleagues to think about the post-letter period. So there really is some sort of a vision that there will be a time that that will not be there anymore. We see the architecture of fabric, where the fabric can take on dimensional form and be wired. This is so cute. This is Annie Albers, her uh, graduation project from 19, I don't know, 1910 or something. It could never be made because we didn't have the yarns to, to manufacture it. And it's only about 10 years ago that it could be realized. 
So there's also this idea that our quest for the future uh, is great because it will feed ideas for a long time to come. Then we want to make hybridic design, which is you know, like this candle and this lamp. It's like burning the things at two edges and then coming together. It's trying to create new matter which we have never seen before, which is sometimes maybe a, a mixture of things. It's trying to create weird things which are very close to our skin, like second skins. It's trying to imitate our own epiderm and our own functioning in new ways. It's using possibly sort of household materials and bringing them into another realm. It's definitely um, disproportionate uh, things. It's also the idea of laser cutting and rusting and eroding and decaying materials. Definitely the study of pattern making and of block printing, but not just block printing, but using that in a completely new and free way. And the handwriting of uh, certain origins, especially Asia, will be also very instructive to continuously learn us about the use of pattern and, and stitching and embroidering. And uh, India will teach us how to make madras, which was almost a forgotten color over. The problem with textile now is that nobody knows what a color woven is or what a jacquard is. So today the journalists say, the comeback of print. And then everything is woven or, you know, it's, it's a disaster really. Because the public is no longer skilled in recognizing what is going on here. And they don't also understand therefore that it's not just a flat print. It's not a photocopy, it, that it's a, a whole, um, technique, that humans are working on this. Then, and this is very exciting, we see that there is a young generation in art and in fashion and in hair, as you see, very keen on making new f fiber, artistic wovens and crochet incredible, one-of-a-kind, um, exclusive visions of hybrid materials brought together, incredible use of garments or fiber. And I'm so fascinated that uh, on the left, it's a uh, it's an, an, uh, work of art of $250,000, and on the right, it's Etsy. This is the first time ever that all these disciplines come together as one, and that there is no hierarchy, and that there is no difference, and that there is a dialogue um, between all these domains, and therefore we hope that our students, whether it's in art, or in fashion, or in design, or in architecture, or any other form, health, uh, transport, uh, will also collaborate and sort of become a body of uh, co-workers. Fashion is also fiber, and this is very cute. This is the last uh, week. We suddenly saw that fiber art started to become dresses at Calvin Klein by Ralph Simons and uh, in Parsons' bachelor course. Amazing stuff. So we have not seen this before. This is really uh, recent, suddenly this, this wildness, which reminds us almost of the 60s which used to be seen in museums and which now suddenly hit the runway. Um, the cover of our magazine is done this way. We see a lot of collage. There is, there is so much uh, to be seen. And it's also industrialized. So embroidery suddenly becomes, uh, the Burlex suddenly do embroidery. That's quite extraordinary. And we, we see that uh, the, the disciplines are sort of getting out of proportion, out of order, out of their normal thing. It's all female work. It's women's work, which suddenly becomes everybody's work. Stitching has a, a big revival. And then, of course, pattern is so important. This is a very personal thing, because in, when, where I was born, my mother had a 
very modernistic Cleopatra bed, and behind the bed was a textile, so we would not make the wall black. You know, it was this textile black and this white deer. And all my childhood was, I, I was seeing this textile, and then I left home and so on, long time later. My mother died and my sister sent me her old television and it was wrapped in this textile. So I opened the box, you know, and the, the appearance of that textile was such an incredible vector of memory. I've rarely had something like that. You sometimes have it with fragrance that you suddenly are sort of transported. Well, certainly pattern is one of those things that it is absolutely uh, tra transporting you into another realm. And this is what I hope we will achieve, that um, we will be able to make such incredible uh, new venues in pattern making and layering and drawing and so on, that it's you know, going to go beyond everything we know now a pattern is and that we will really push things much further than today. Definitely color story studies and color concepts are of course part of this. Color woven is very important. This is a project from last year from a student, Kalu Guan. Uh, unfortunately, the film doesn't work, but um, these patterns are um, communicating. So when you want to make a photo of somebody in this dress, in this coat, there's, you have a film on your phone. So it's sort of in, it's inventing a new language of pattern which comes to life when you picture it. Can you imagine what that does to publicity? It's a bit scary, but it's amazing at the same time. So there is also a lot of coiling going on nowadays that's, that we will go there as well. And then of course we will have dye studios and try to understand the power of color and the distribution of color and what color does to public space, to private space. How can we take color uses from the past, like henne, into the future? How can we dye with uh, rust and with flowers? How can we use indigo in very new and contemporary ways? How can we just develop this um, from, with people from all over the planet because it's really becoming a new language in design. Then, of course, the planet is very much um, part of our concern. Hopefully, we will uh, really create a master's which, is, which has um, the possibility to reach a better future, to make a, a better uh, society. And therefore, we want to bring together Silicon Valley and Hudson Valley, which are both trying to create in a new way so that we can reach a more a, a utopia if we want. So at this point, recycling is very much on our mind. Uh, I call it often reincarnation because it goes much further than just transformation. And one beautiful example is the new endeavor of Eileen Fisher. She is, as you know, a big American brand. She gives $5 to every piece you give back to her. Then she selects the pieces. Then she has a second-hand shop of her own stuff for people who cannot afford normally the line. Then she has a transformed clothing line with bits and pieces of the rest which looks so creative that you just know that it's going to be successful. And you also know that this is going to inform the mother brand to be more brave and creative. You just see how the whole recycling effort is also recycling the energy of creativity. And then with the cashmere sweaters, they make these incredible blankets, wall hangings. Sometimes it's close to art, it really looks Super amazing. There is two exhibits going to be in New York Textile Mons. And suddenly, this brand, which is an average price point, finds itself being a luxury brand with a luxury product, almost for galleries. So they, they just completely transform their own um, business plan almost. It's so interesting to see what 
the, the wish for recycling can engender. Absolutely, we see there's not almost one student today in fashion or design which is not thinking about uh, the deconstruction and the reconstruction of cloths. There's many um, initiatives to do this also in um, economies who, who, that are in need. Pekka Heikoop is doing this in leather. In New York, we have an initiative called Fab Scrap, which is an organization which brings all the waste of the textile industry together and then makes it into new matter. And she told us last year that the amount of shit per year is three quarters of the weight of the Brooklyn Bridge. Just New York. So imagine what that is in the world. Imagine what that does to our planet. Imagine what all this waste, of all this wasteful things, you know, there's much too much offer. People don't buy anymore because they just cannot see anymore. Uh, there is this, uh, this concern in the fashion industry that there is people stop buying because there is no joy anymore because you cannot discern. Um, so we need to follow Brigitte's lead and we need to go away for a year and <sighs> breathe and do things slower and better. That is absolutely certain. Uh, Suzanne Tick, who's also going to be with us with uh, her um, team as one of the ateliers. She is recycling, for instance, balloons because on her beach she finds all these ch children party balloons which are completely devastating the ocean. So she makes them into new yarns and new works of art. And um, I think it, almost at the beginning of this movement, has been a very important um, show here in Parsons by um, a guy called Kahwan Kahwanishi. He's uh, having a great future already, and he somehow um, expressed all the disgust of overconsumption in this show, and at the same time, therefore, created these monuments to um, the threshold of our two centuries. So this is where we want to go, and it's only just a sketch yet because we don't know, you know what surprises we will have, what will definitely come out of this. We just have this um, wish and this um, um, strength, I think, to bring together this program, and we hope it is going to um, participate in a better world and create incredible creativity. And we will continue together with Willem to do the New York Textile Month. This is the second time we do it. At least for three more years we will organize it because we think that it has incredible momentum. Already second time is much more exciting than first time. You can buy the catalog if you want, that would help us because we all pre personally finance this. Um, it's, an, it's a titanic effort, of course, it's incredible. But there is almost uh, 90, I think, events this month. So you can go to something almost every other day. There's openings and talks and, and visits of studios. And they are already booked out. So we just see that there is this, well, this willingness to listen and also this happiness to share. And I think that the happiness is also very important in textile. Thank you. Thank you.